if you look outside, uh, we are um, people around the world could be a minority group, an ethnic group, an environmental group who doesn't like what the company is doing and really want to do harm and they can criticize and they can join with others to, to really make a big uh, negative impact on the company's reputation. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Farko Bekali, your host. Today we're going to talk about corporate scandals, dirty governance and PR blunders. Remember the German fintech company Wirecard? It's actually only another addition to a very long list of corporate misconduct. Remember Enron, WorldCom, BP, Deepwater Horizon, and of course, VW, Dieselgate, to just name a few, oh, such as maybe I forgot Lehman Brothers, AIG, Madoff, etc., etc. I could go on for hours. But one thing for sure, the question here is, what is the common denominator? What is the impact if a corporate scandal breaks into the world? Let's say it that way. Uh, the common denominator could be the share price going down, of course, the bottom line of the company being hit, but most importantly, the reputation may get damaged and the trust of the stakeholder may get damaged for a long time. So why not talk about reputation management? What does it take to establish a reputation, keep it up, especially in times of crisis such as now during the COVID-19 crisis? And there's no better that I could have invited than Bernhard Bauhofer. He's the CEO and founding partner of sparing partners here in Switzerland. He works internationally. He's been writing quite a few books on the issue and he's joining me right now here on Mentory TV. Bernard, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Patricia. It's an honor to be on your show. Thank you very much. Well, corporate reputation, reputation management. I sometimes fear, Bernard, it's uh, maybe not necessarily in a daily focus, but tell us first of all, what is the definition of reputation management? Well, companies in these days and also person, uh, private persons are exposed to a, a complexity of, of factors, a complexity of stakeholders who are influencing their, their daily business, right? And uh, uh, but look you, uh, looking back into the last millennium, uh, we have had much more stable and predictable environment for companies to work in. There was no internet, there was a lack of transparency and uh, no critical stakeholder looking into what's really going on behind the walls of a company, right? That was a time of the image. So you could pretend to be a, a clean, uh, a reliable and uh, high quality per, uh, company without any stakeholder uh, looking into, into the back of the wall. They didn't have the opportunity. But now the, the, the world, due to the internet, in principle has changed dramatically. We have a, a high transparency, we have a high velocity of information circulating around the world. We have the stakeholders interconnected with each other, communicating about a company. And they're looking precisely on what's going on. It's in terms of environmental issues, of social issues, societal issues, and of course, how the, the management is conducting the business. So the world has become much more complex. Yeah, the world has become more complex. And as you were just saying, velocity is definitely picking up. So if something happens here right now, it may be transmitted, communicated, and known on the other side of the planet in a very short time, damaging your reputation. Would you say that these days, uh, companies have actually become much more vulnerable because of that? Absolutely. And it's almost un impossible to control the whole uh, environment, what's going around. Because even uh, if you look in internally, internal stakeholders, the employers, uh, the employees, but, um, they are in, in a good sense ambassadors of the company. If they really uh, stand behind the company, believe in the, in the value, the, in, the, in the moral, and in all the business and the purpose of the company. But in a negative sense, if they don't, if just already... Um, which signed internally, uh, they could really do harm to a company. So um, it has been much more vulnerable. But also in, in terms of uh, shareholder activism, if you look outside, uh, we are uh, people around the world could be a minority group, an ethnic group, an environmental group who doesn't like what the company is doing and really want to do harm and they can criticize and they can join with others to, to really make a big uh, negative impact on the company's reputation.
Well, that is an interesting one that you were just saying, shareholder activism, because we don't even have to have the situation where there is a scandal or rotten governance or something uh, miscommunicated. It's just shareholders can be heard on a much broader basis just because they don't like the, the, the strategy of the company going forward. Absolutely. And, you know, the share price, and this is a, a pattern which we are uh, uh, seeing all over, over the world over the decades. If you're looking, you, you mentioned it in the introduction, starting from Enron to WorldCom to UBS, uh, we have seen immediate impact and immediate negative impact on the share price once a, a reputational crisis is just uh, taking off. And, uh, and this is in the re in, 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 in normally just take a couple of months and it has a negative impact and people keep this negative experience yeah. with the company in the back of their minds and they're just very cautious in, in terms of investing into a company because they might not trust into the policy and to the a triple bottom line approach, which uh, is crucial these days. And we'll talk about the triple uh, bottom line approach in a minute. But you just mentioned something super important, which I think is something earned, takes a long time to be earned and gained and maybe crushed in a matter of seconds. And that is trust. So you do have a certain reputation as a person as well as a company. Uh, and then you do something that is out of line and people other corporations, all the stakeholders you were mentioning, they just jump back. And then the time until people trust again could either never happen or takes a very long time. What's the real long-term impact there if trust is lost? Well, this for, depends on the nature of the crisis. Uh, if it's, um, people understand this is just a singular uh, failure of the company, they are... Um, they're ready to say, listen, oh, that's okay. We we okay, forget so about that. This is, just an, this is just an accident. Mm -hmm. but this is not a consequence of an, an, an internal in, intrinsic uh, policy, uh, which is, is, is wrong. But, it's, and then, but if we talk about a huge scandal, you mentioned BP, right? Uh, Deepwater <laughs> Horizon, which was uh, the biggest oil spill in the history, probably. Um, this has certainly a long-term impact, and it impacted a lot of stakeholders. Being in the shareholders of the company, being the, the residents of, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. So many people had really bad experience, uh, uh, financial damage. And the environment in general, which belongs to anyone on the earth, has been damaged. So this has a long term impact. It takes years to rebuild um, the reputation of this company. And it takes the right person on the top, the CEO. Uh, remember that the CEO at that time, he was, he was caught on the jock uh, uh, while the crisis was bursting and uh, he, was, he was having a good time. So that's a horrible reputation. Yeah, that's it's a big no-no. Very uh, long time to rebuild this. Yeah, I remember, I remember um, not only it happening, but I also watched the film Deep Water Horizon with Mark Wahlberg, and I can only yeah. really recommend that. It's super, really well done. And interestingly is how it might have been put. Well, it's an accident. There is an oil spill, but drilling deeper literally into, uh, you know, what really happened behind the scene, that there was coast cutting going before security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, this is where, where the CEO, the strategic decisions may really have a long-term impact in terms of not only the company itself or the employees but all the supplying companies as well which I think with BP uh, also happened and you mentioned the share price um, Bernard and when that happened in April the 9th I think the scandal came out 2010 the share price of BP was 640 US dollar and then a couple of months later it was 304 so it's it was less than half of it. And that's the kind of impact that you can really visibly not only see, but feel in your pockets when there is corporate misconduct. Absolutely. And uh, look, it's all about um, managing expectations of a company. Reputation is about managing expectations of your stakeholders. So if you just try to make people believe that you are an environmentally friendly uh, company that you are really have a great code of conduct that you have a great corporate culture uh, and you're just constantly promoting this and then you just don't comply with your own promises this is creating false expectations and in the very beginning people think this might be an, an accident or it's just an, an uh, only one one occasion but then when you continue do, doing it so you will have create your own uh, negative reputation that's that's the point 
Well, I think the expectation aspect, Bernard, is really, really important because what do you do as a corporation if you do actively, proactively manage your reputation, but then you have the black sheep in the company that do something, uh, whether it is a fraud or whether there is some tweaking of the product or, or, or. How do you, as, you know, looking at the big company itself, then really make sure there is no black sheep amongst the employees or whoever is involved to then not rise up to those expectations and that image that you've been building over years? Well, Patricia, this is basically impossible. You cannot um, say for sure that anyone within your stakeholder community and and, uh, world would ever um, do something negative, which could harm, potentially harm your reputation, being it the employees or clients or whatever. There's already always somebody out who wants to do, do you some, cause you some damage. That's yes. not the point. But what you can do is you can try to co- create a corporate culture with a clear code of conduct, with a clear vision, with a clear mission and values, which has to have to be operationalized to anyone in your company in relation to external stakeholders. Uh, so you have a clear value proposition. You have a clear guidance in terms of how you dealing with the world inside the company and outside the company. Um, You can incentivize people to do good. You can also give sanctions if they're not behaving. Uh, And, and, you know, over time, and we we see good examples. We're always talking about the bad examples, but they're very good examples as well, Uh, which is Novo Nordisk, a Danish pharmaceutical company, which is really working on the triple bottom line philosophy for decades now. Or there is... Um, rush from the pharmaceutical industry as well from the Swiss company who have intrinsically um, uh, intrinsically pursuing a, a sustainable approach and they have to take the long-term view there is no greed there is no shareholder pressure and they are not being they don't allow it to be put under pressure by shareholders and short-term pressure and short-term performance I think that's key once you put your employees on the short-term pressure Look at Volkswagen. They wanted to be number one uh, manufacturer worldwide by, I think it was at that time, by 2020, they failed dramatically in terms of quality. And and the engineers were so put so much under pressure that they took decisions where they harming the company. That that is such a crucial point because it is great for shareholders, of course, to hear the company that you're holding the shares of to have a long-term vision and beat finally Toyota to become the world's number one manufacturer. But that is great. And I'm sure it was also enhancing, you know, the image and expectations of shareholders, analysts, et cetera, et cetera. But then internally, really the mishap happened. There was so much pressure that people did the wrong thing because if they didn't, they might have lost their job. Is this how really, you know, how it goes, it filters down in a corporation? Of course, it starts on the top. And then you look at, um, at Volkswagen, this was not only the crew, but they had several brands. So when you have this, and we're coming now to the brand uh, issue, which I, I know you're interested in, Volkswagen has a, the crew brand and it has several individual brands like Volkswagen, like Audi, like Lamborghini, and m- many others, Skoda and Seat. And once this top level is uh, harnessed and then uh, tarnished, uh, excuse me, then the, the rest of the, of the group is also um, impacted. And I think it, it starts in the bottom and uh, you remember now this crisis is still going on. The or- former Audi boss is still under scrutiny. There's a lot of things going on. So this shows the long-term impact of a negative reputation. And um, so it's very crucial, crucial to have the right boss. Uh, look at look at uh, other bosses like Paul, Paul Pullman, who is uh, he's really going after sustainability, and he really auth- authentically is representing what he's saying within the company. Um, and so there has to be a change of, of culture. There has to be a change of leadership. This is critical for the long-term success of a company. And I think that long-term is exactly the issue. I feel also from my background, you know, when I was still anchoring for CNBC, that 
strategies went from corporate reporting to corporate reporting because whatever there was, they had to perform, otherwise the share price would be punished. And very few companies, at least back then, had the guts, and I have to say it's the guts, to really say, okay, we're going to sacrifice our share performance because we have to invest long term. And the investment will cost money and that will hit our balance sheet, um, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes, or back then, it wasn't that accepted than today when they say, okay, we're going to have not the best of numbers going for forward for quite a few quarters, but long term, we have a different strategy and we're going to follow it. If you like it, shareholder, great. If you don't like it, you know, take your consequences. Do you think that already there is a bit of a cultural change, a shift happening? Well, honestly, there are some good examples, as I told you. It's not on our desk. It's Paul Pullman. Um, and um, these people are in really authentically and they really truly believe in sustainability and they should don't let themselves, the company, be put under pressure on the short-term um, shareholder activism and short-term uh, shareholder pressure. But they need the backing of the supervisory board. And in the long end, they need the backing of the investors. The, the investors have to which on behalf of, uh, if we're talking about institutional investors, on behalf of uh, private people are investing to a company, they have to say no to short-term greed. We're talking about purpose, which impacts every one of us. We have to save the planet. We have to really get into a sustainable working mode, uh, which is inevitable. Um, and I think the companies are at the early stage understand, understand the necessity of a change in terms of how they run the business will long-term uh, profit from their, their, from their uh, courage and, and, and their long-term vision. I think it's inevitable that uh, these sustainable companies uh, are, um, are really moving forward. But at the same time, we still see that even in the corona crisis, Investors have a sh very short-term uh, view. They're looking at the drop of the share price. They're getting nervous. They yeah. don't see the potential signal of this crisis. They say, listen, we have done so much harm to nature and environment. We now really have to, to change. Otherwise, uh, there is no future for our future generations. Yeah, and we are going to talk about the book you that came ah. out and you published uh, right basically at, at the, the start when we felt the start here in Switzerland of the mm -hmm. corona crisis. And I would like to talk about that as well. But let's back circle. You were talking about expectations. Now, of course, there's two things. One is the image and the other one is the perception. So I think I have a certain image as a corporation or as a person, but the perception might be totally different. So there must be an ongoing monitoring process. Perhaps we can start a little bit with what you do, how you really manage the reputation, the strategies, how you go about sitting with a company and say, okay, this is the long-term plan, how you establish a reputation and how you keep it and how you react in times of crisis or even to a corporate scandal within your own company. Well, well I think there are two concepts, which one is image. And remember the bad good old days in, in the 80s when Coca-Cola had a global um, uh, commercials saying that we are the best, we have a fresh company, we're a sexy company, we attract the best consumers. And we, we are creating a lifestyle. And we knew at that time that this company right, was quite a, a typical US run business. It wasn't that great. It was, uh, people were uh, really uh, working under enormous pressure to reach the goal. So that was not fun at all, put it like this. Now in times of reputation, it's about creation, creating expectation and managing expectations. And you have to earn your uh, reputation over a long time, every single day uh, in relation with your stakeholders. So when we talk to companies and say, um, and by the way, particularly privately owned companies who have their personal name in the company name. So that's the same understand the necessity of, of reputation management because a potential crisis would not only affect their business, but only their family's reputation and family's name. So we sit together and look, we do an audit. How is your current reputation? Are we asking existing stakeholders? That's most probably um, that's, uh, employees and um, in, in a public company, uh, run company, it's also uh, shareholders. External clients, uh, it might be activists, it might be uh, unions, and whatever. This, this depends from, from company to company. And then we understand not only how they perceive the company, but they, how they really experience a company in a daily corporation. You know? Are they really complying with their 
promises in terms of innovation, about quality, about governance, about social responsibility, about environmental issues and so forth. And then we, at the same time, um, ask the company, uh, the ma company's manager, how they think they are being experienced by the yeah. stakeholders. And then we see the gap. And there's, well, I think that's human. People understand that uh, we think, everybody thinks we are being perceived in a better way or being experienced. And, and then they understand. And then the, the normal reaction is, that, no, no, that's not possible because we have invested, for instance, a lot of money into quality. And now they're saying our, our products are not that good right but that's and reality is, there, is it then really about the quality or being you know, not being able to communicate it right because we do have also perhaps a gap between image and perception your values um and what people perceive as your values there might be a communication gap that's a good point um patricia but i think the consumers are very well educated they have access to fantastic information and they're list looking uh, listening to other peers so they get quite a good picture uh, of what the, uh, the reality is. No, I think they really understand what the values of a companies are with respect to different so-called reputational drivers, being a quality innovation and so forth. And while asking different people, we get the real, I would say, the realistic uh, picture of what is the truth, uh, if you wish to say. And then we ask the management and then we see the gap and we see also the... Uh, necessity of what has to be done. So on the basis of that, we do develop the reputational strategy, the concept, and the whole program, which encompasses all stakeholders, all reputational drivers. And then we're supporting the company in really top-down uh, training the people. Implementing this, it. In implementing mm -hmm. it, exactly. So also this process, just the fact that the company is taking care of its reputation, they're realizing it's important, is a strong signal insight towards the employees and, and other stakeholders, just a sheer fact. And then um, the, once this corporate culture is, is driven by this reputational perception and the uh, understanding of the importance of it, the crises are normally not that severe anymore. People are constantly aware of that while being trained that this is important that, about what they are doing, right? And then we have a code of conduct, we have the values, we have some clear value proposition with respect to the individual responsibility of the employee, right? And then normally it doesn't, it's quite crisis proven. But as I said before, you cannot, uh, uh, there's always a potential crisis. But then we also train these people how to react. It has to be open. You have to be very reactive. You have to be responsive. You have to monitor and track what's going on, particularly in the social media and in the internet era. So to be really sure that you're not, you're not uh, hiding yourself, but, but you're proactively and, and, and confidently uh, uh, responding to a crisis. I think that's key. Yeah, I think the proactivity is very important. And one thing I want to ask you in your experience, how difficult is it really for a company to formulate their basic values? You've mentioned a couple of times, you know, the triple bottom line. Do you sometimes feel when you speak to CEOs or the managing team that, okay, these should be the values because you might think it's right or it's good for the world, the planet, the nature, but there might be an inconsistency between what they really want to do, which is just, you know, generating uh, good numbers and making profits and by what you are saying and they'll do it despite. That's a good point. And, and the inconsistencies depends or is a consequence of, of a couple of factors. One is if you are in, in, uh, in a CEO employed by a public listed company, your job, top job is maybe within two or three years to make a turnaround and then leave. So you're not really interested in, in a long-term success. That's the point. You just want to get your brownie points. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. Uh, this is and, and second, we've received privately owned companies because that's their heritage. It's their company. They want a long-term performance. They even think about the succession planning in two or three generations. They are really, possibly even not if they are able to explicitly say what their values are, but they're living their values. And that's our job to understand how to verbalize it, right? To make this, um, to make this, to to write this down in a vision or mission statement and then convey it to the employees who then in, in their work with their outside stakeholders have to live and prove it. 
that's that's the point now. Yeah. Um, but the point is, and I think that's exactly the, the problem of the shareholder value paradigm. This is not meant to be long term. This is not meant to be sustainable. And though we have really a problem and uh, how they call it a, a target conflict. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I feel that it is it is shifting. Hopefully, I see more and more funds looking into, in, you know, sustainable, sustainable investments and the triple bottom line that you mentioned early on. You know, you, you, you said about privately owned companies, of course, they don't have the shareholder activism risk, they don't have the pressure from the analysts hitting or not hitting or outstripping expectations and hence <coughs> so the, the impact in terms of the share price. Let's talk about a very interesting case that's been happening right now. And allow me to share a screen here with you and also with everybody else. So that is the example that I wanted to pull out. Uncle Ben's and Aunt Jemima. Brands, Bernard, I mean, since the 40s or 70 years for Uncle Ben's. And Aunt Jemima, I think, is a 131-year-old brand by a company that is privately owned, and that is the Mars family. Now, very interesting, of course, in the wake of George Floyd's death, I stopped sharing now because everybody saw it, uh, uh, killing, rather to say, and the Black Lives Matter movement, something very interesting happened. And that is, uh, well, of course, there was the accusation that Mars did touch a very sensitive issue and it would, was stereotyping in a racist way. Uh -huh. Now, I'm sure that the company 131 years ago or 70 years ago did not think about it, but just felt like, hey, you know, <laughs> is somebody making damn good rice? Is somebody making really nice other products? And they happen to be of a certain color. The reaction was that there is a rebranding going on. Now, Uncle Ben's Rice is Ben's original. That is PR. Is that proactive to you? Is that just something, a crisis that happens because of our world changing, our expectation changing, you know, having a certain president resulting in, you know, political upheaval from, uh, from the population? How would, you, how would you characterize it? And do you think they did a good job with Mars? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the pressure is enormous. Uh, in, in the very end, the company has to react. It would have been better, of course, uh, to act proactively and then say, listen, we gonna, we perceive, uh, anticipate the potential risks when it comes to, um, to Black Lives Matter issues or um, ethical minorities, and this is not politically correct and we don't support it anymore, right? And, and, um, and they could have changed that, but look at the company. One of the biggest, the, 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 one of the biggest percentage of costs is going into marketing and building up a brand over time, the so-called goodwill. And honestly, um, I'm, I strongly support this kind of activism, which is very important. And Me Too is one of that kind. And I think uh, mm -hmm. that's the great blessings of our times that we really don't accept this and we can make this, put this pressure on companies to move and change. But at the same time, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of decision makers. Uncle Ben's Rice is a, a, a brand I have known since childhood and uh, you have some emotional bond to, to these brands. And I never felt that there was any uh, yeah. relation to racism. And then there was even, and I would even I would even cons think that even uh, color people would not feel uh, really uh, that this is uh, That's my insulting point. them. That is it's such a them. crucial point. If I yeah. may interrupt there, Bernard, I think that is such a crucial point because uh, not only that these are household brands, but if racism was even an, wasn't even an issue anymore several years ago, then having different colored people on your products as a brand shouldn't matter, shouldn't be really picked up on. But now as there is, uh, has been the revelation of a more racist society than perhaps expected uh, also post Martin Luther King, of course, people are starting to scapegoat or shoot or pick up on something that, as you were saying, the company should have proactively picked up on many many years ago but if they felt there's an equality that there is no racism so why not uh, have different ethnic uh, figures representing their brands 
Absolutely. And you know what, this is not um, consistent in, in, on, on a global scale. I know it from, I lived in Latin America, there are many colored people, and, and they call that the colored people just in this particular case of Uncle Ben's rice, have just this, this specific flavor, which it really makes a meal very delicious. Uh, so they perceive it very positively. And I think what the U.S. are currently going through is a dramatic when it comes to racism, but this has been going on for decades. Yeah. Black Lives Matter hasn't been invented recently, but we are now impacted by this. And in this particular point of changing an established brand because of this pressure from outside is also happening in Switzerland. Right, this double modern fit, and I was into you regarding that. And I said, "Listen, um, a company has to be, of course, be politically correct, and it has to really uh, respect all the diversity and all the multiple people in their companies and outside. At the same time, one has to understand that this is a zeitgeist issue as well, right? And um, a company has to have time, has to have strategic issues, and in the case of um, um, Negro, uh, the company reacted on the basis of one critical point from an anonymous uh, uh, Twitter user. Right? Well, I think this is uh, really, really important. And just for our viewers that might not speak German, um, there is this kind of marshmallow sweet. Yeah. Uh, and it's chocolate coated. And they are super delicious. I grew up with them. And you... <laughs> You know, once you start with one, you can't stop. But the point is, when I was little, they were called, translated, Negro kisses. Okay. And uh, that was then, after a while, seen as politically incorrect. So they had to also rebrand and they call them now chocolate kisses or cream kisses or whatever because of the, the marshmallow inside. And um, again, as a child, I was never thinking about it. As a child, you might not, but I never felt that there was this kind of environment. Do you actually think that Migro, you know, after that one Twitter tweet did the right thing of rebranding, which is a huge exercise, which is very, very costly, but perhaps short-term costly, long-term beneficial. And that wraps up the first part of my conversation with Bernhard Bauhofer on reputation management. If you like our conversations here on Mentory TV, make sure to give us a like, to share, and perhaps also to subscribe to the YouTube channel.